1971, a manga author, Shotaro Ishinomori, had created a new superhero that was a grasshopper theme for Toei to put into a television series. His name was Kamen Rider. He was a man who, a race car, or a, a bike racer driver. Wow, bike racer driver, that sounds awesome. <laughs> He was a bike racer who got captured by villains, was turned into a cyborg, but they, for some reason, didn't change his mind before they transformed him. So he got away and became a hero. The series went on to become a huge success, running 98 episodes, and ended up taking over what Ultraman, uh, the, the, the title that Ultraman had going on in the 60s as being the reigning champion for Tokusatsu. If you don't know what tokusatsu means, it means special effects in Japanese because these are live action shows that utilize a plethora of special effects. Kamen Rider had multiple series throughout the 70s. In the early 80s, Toei started to put Kamen Rider on the back burner and started to put, put all the resources into a new franchise called Metal Heroes. That took over. They did do another Kamen Rider, two Kamen Rider series in the late 80s called Black and Black RX, which were successful. However, Black RX was pretty much the end of the franchise for about 11 years. Mm -hmm. However, at least television series once. Then, in, in the uh, blah 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 blah. In the 90s. Well, we'll get to the movie trilogy. Let's play the introduction clips. to Kamen Rider Heisei Phase 1, Part 1 of Multiple Panels. So after Black RX, which pretty much started at the end of the Showa era and ended at the start of the Heisei era, Toei was like, well, you know what, Kamen Rider's cool, fans loved it, however, we're working on Metal Heroes, Super Sentai's not doing so well anymore, we don't know what we want to do. So they put Kamen Rider on the back burner, Super Sentai really took off in the 1990s with Jetman and going forward. Metal Heroes was still doing well, so they didn't want to do a full-length series for Kamen Rider. So they hired this guy named, um, wow, Onimusha. Keita Amamea. I was going to say, I never played Onimusha. Garo. Keita Amamea, who had worked on Kamen Rider Black, to helm a movie trilogy series where each, for three years in a row, they had three different movies. First was one called Shin Kamen Rider Prologue, which was a more violent type Kamen Rider that was more animalistic, well, or insect looking than your previous heroes. The next one was called Zeto, and then another one called J, where the Kamen Rider basically copied Ultraman because he could grow huge. So here's just a small snippet of the three movies. Fatality. <laughs> <laughs> 
like this. <laughs> Do you want me to go backwards? Okay, um... It's fine, just leave it. You've already ruined the gym. Okay. See. Leave it. We'll just deal with it there. So! Yes, staring at Jay's crotch. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's Gecky from Jew Rangers, so you should enjoy it. Absolutely. All right, so after this Kamen Rider movie trilogy, which all seemed like that they were, it seemed like Toei was testing, well, if these movies do well, maybe we should do more. Nothing came out of it. And good news for those that like to support official releases, supposedly Media Blasters is going to be releasing these three movies later on this year in America on Blu-ray. However, so... Kamen Rider, that was pretty much the end for a little bit. Then the Metal Hero series started to tank in ratings, and Toei was like, yeah, we're kind of over Metal Heroes now. Let's go back to Kamen Rider. So in the 2000s, they decided to launch a series called Kamen Rider Kuga. And at the end of 1988 or 89's Black RX, they had introduced a concept that the Kamen Rider could have multiple form changes. It was an interesting idea. Nothing truly was significant came out of it, but it was there. So when they brought back Kuga, Kamen Rider with Kuga, they decided to make these change, these body changes, actually part of the story, where some aspects he could utilize to fight to increase his ability against certain villains. So the series starts off with this guy named Goda Yusuke, who comes back to Japan after visiting some parts of the world. He's this easygoing guy who loves to stick his thumb up to everyone to signify everything's going to be okay. He, an old team of his that at the university he studied at are murdered by an ancient being in these ruins they uncover. He ends up finding this belt that he puts on that transforms him into Kamen Rider Kuga. Now, at the start of the series, he actually has a white base form before his main form takes over, which is a red body. And then, as the series progresses, he gains a blue form that allows him to jump high and he can turn items into a spear. He gains a green form that allows him to use guns for range attacks. A purple form that has a sword so he can do more melee combat. And in ultimate form, if, if you've watched modern series, usually the Kamen Rider gets their ultimate form early on in the series. He didn't actually get his ultimate form until the very end of the series. The villains are these beings of creatures called Grungi. They are these animal or plant motifs whose human forms look like goth culture gone Horrible, horribly no, they wrong. Don't they look like '90s goth culture? Okay, '90s goth culture, but they're with murderous intents. Yes. '90s goth culture was with murderous intents. Have you seen Cradle of Filth videos? No, I haven't seen Cradle of Filth videos. What about Guar? Nope. <laughs> so the Grongi, their whole point of killing was—it was all a game to them. They would say, okay, I'm going to kill X number of people within this time frame uh, under these circumstances with no remorse. Int it's interesting when they started to learn how to work human technology because then they could start using vehicles and stuff to kill people with. And the Grongi didn't care if you were a man, woman, or a child. You were just a game to them. So here are some clips to Kamen Rider Kuga. You know, after Jay's done. <laughs> yeah. The Fresh Maker.
looks like we're in the teens somewhere. You forgot the most evil of all the Grongi, the one who sealed the race's fate, the one whose cruelty denies them any sympathy ever, ever, ever. You're forgetting Zuzenda, the Rhino Grongi. This belligerent beefcake committed the ultimate crime. He took a life that can never be replaced. He, more than any other Grongi, deserves no sympathy or mercy. He killed Mikado. It was a German shepherd. He's a good puppy. Did you look at how cute this puppy is? Mikado. I'm not done complaining about this. Not until I at least witness his death in triplicate. With a catchy montage. Special thanks to Silverquill for that. So one thing to know about Kamen Rider Kuga, if you are used to more modern series where you get toy plosions in front of your face every single second, Kuga might throw you off because Kuga and its follow-up Gito were written as more like cop dramas. A lot of it is the co you'll have cops trying to figure out what's going on, why all these murders are occurring. The hero in Kuga, he actually works directly with the cops. So some people are like, well, Kuga's boring because it's just people talking and investigating. Where's all the toys and gimmicks and explosions? And I feel like that's what really separates Kuga from other Kamen Rider series. Because back also at the time, during the Showa era, Kamen Rider's formula was monster attacks, Kamen Rider tries to stop him, the monster gets away, Kamen Rider fights later, defeats him, end of story. And that was pretty much the formula throughout the entire Showa era. So they wanted to try something different to make it more dramatic to gain audience members. And it worked extremely well. Women loved Kamen Rider Kabuto, or Kuga. Kuga. Yeah. Kamen Rider Kuga. In fact, the actor who plays Yusuke has had nonstop success in everything he is in because he has this complete dedicated fangirl following. And that's what also elevated Kamen Rider into being a more mature, series franchise going forward and one thing I consider is back for Super Sentai I consider the 90s of Sentai to be the experimentation period 
I feel like the 2000s is the experimentation period for Common Rider because that's what they were always trying out new things and if they didn't work then they would go the next series would try something completely different. Now Agito takes place two years after Kuga and the police have decided have created their own Kamen Rider unit on top of there being a new Kamen Rider who appears that they're like oh he resembles the previous Kamen Rider. Now as the main character of the Agito, Suichi, he has amnesia throughout the entire series. So he's growing in development as you watch as you are because you're learning about his life at the same time he is. And the interesting and also with the Gito, it's very there's a lot of elements that feel like they're taken out of a Stephen King novel, especially when they reveal what happened to Suichi towards the end of the show. The villains of this story, the Lords, I can't really go into details on why they're called that. But if you look at what they, when they go attack people, which they love attacking people, and again, they don't discriminate, like the Grongi didn't, only yeah, they, they have... actually went after a baby. Yeah, they went Europe. after a baby in one episode. But you will see them, they start doing this, like, some type of cross-like movement with some type of religious symbolism you don't learn about till later. And they are kind of have a leader who's starts out as a child that we nicknamed Damien when we were watching the show. And there's also a couple other common writers that appear in this. One's named Gills, who is this swimmer who got injured and finds his body changing into this creature. Now, throughout the remainder pieces of the footage, because of time reasons, I can't show you every single form to every single rider, nor do I have time to show you every single rider, because that would take like four hours to do. So I've cut down to mostly the most important riders and the main form along with the ultimate forms. Which in this case is Shining Agito and Burning Agito. Anything I'm missing? No, um, just for Kuga and for Agito, if you're interested in watching these series, especially if you haven't, um, Toku Shoutsu, which As is, Kuga. Has, is Shouts Factories, um, channel has this series uh, along with others and then there's also Tubi which you can also watch a lot of these series as well yeah. legally in the US. Shout Factory also just is on Pluto now too so you can watch Kuga, Ryuki, and Zero One there. Yeah. And original. Yeah. Yeah. Act. Play Gito. Henshin!
So after Gito and Kuga, they decided to totally decide to take Kamen Rider into a new route. They had a concept where the Kamen Riders would make contracts with monsters in Mirror Worlds, fight monsters in Mirror Worlds on top of other Kamen Riders, with the notion that there's 13 Riders, only one can survive, and the one who gets, the, gets to be the last one gets to make any wish they desire. So basically, if you know the story of Highlander, the Highlander. And this one has her favorite Kamen Rider crush, Kamen Rider Knight, who is a biker chick because Diggs love loner bits. Here we are, born to be kings, we're the about Ryuki, if you weren't aware, is that Ryuki is kind of the first series of the Kamen Rider franchise that also had a female rider. Sadly, it was only in the movie, um, so it wasn't like a part of the series, but it was a stepping stone for that particular franchise because usually women in Kamen Rider series were either the damsels in distress or very subordinate players. Yeah, because in the 70s they had a female hero named Tackle, but she was not considered a Kamen Rider. This was the first time they actually had a actual character, her name's Kamen Rider Femme. And so it was exciting um, for a lot of fans at that time because there was a new version of representation that had never happened before. And some of you may know Kamen Rider Ryuki was brought to America as Kamen Rider Dragon Knights. Which did do one, th which quality wise would determine, but one thing it did better than Ryuki did is it actually had all 13 riders in its actual series. Compared to Ryuki, where you only had 10 riders actually show up, two were relegated to special, uh, to a movie, and the other one was relegated to a special. So you had to watch them and basically say, okay, this must be an alternate universe to events that occur that they change the timeline and it gets confusing where you could pull out your board and be like, well, this time goes over here, this time goes over here, and then it'll go over here and over there. And Ryuki also gets confusing because one of the specials is considered an alternate ending. Yep. Yeah. So after Ryuki, they kind of went more back to basics with their next series, Kamen Rider Fives. Which recently was voted by Japanese fans their favorite all time series. Yep. What's up? And. Fives is the all time favorite series according to Japanese fans. Yeah. So, and this one, the villains were these beings called Orphanox, who are apparently supposed to be the next stage of evolution. They are beings that people that basically, if their hearts are destroyed, they'll either disintegrate or they become an Orphanox. And the one thing I will say I like about the Orphanox is they're this, all of them have this gray universal body form to them. So they all look like a, as if they're wearing like a suit of armor. And it's pretty cool when you see them all lined up, just how uniform it looks all together. The main heroes here is a guy named Takumi who is just this vagabond who 
doesn't want to have friends, doesn't want to deal with anyone, and he just gets pulled into this situation because the belts in this show are very finicky of who can wield them, and he seems to be the only one who can properly wield the Fives belt as far as, they, uh, as far as normal humans are concerned, or so they know. Then the secondary rider is a complete douchebag who his secondary foot and unlike Fies, who does have a couple of mul multiple forms, Kaiser's secondary form is what I call Corrupt Duster Mode. <laughs> if you've seen the show, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> there is another rider who's in there whose belt gets passed around like an STD. And the, for the Orphanox, so we've got our main trio of heroes, Takumi, girl, one of the girls in there, and this other guy that joins up with them that they end up living with. And then there's two sides to the villains. There's a trio of Orphanox who don't want to kill humans that are deemed rebel Orphanox. And then you have the main Orphanox who are like, well, our job is to kill humans and to imp increase our numbers. the biggest detriment of the series that could have solved so many problems across its entire 50 episode one run is if they had just freaking communicated with people so many issues would not have happened and it would have been like a 10 episode series yeah now we're on to your favorite in this era yes my personal favorite common rider series which is a playing card motif where all the villains are based on a house card, so you've got like a spade tech, spade ace, spade ten, and all that good stuff. Most of the monsters in this series, most of the undead for the lower ranks are brainless goons who just go around killing people, whereas the later, the upper classes, the jacks, kings, queens, who you'll see in one of the clips here, they can tr transform from monster to human forms. And this series had, because there's four houses, four four different riders. 
with Ch uh, Blade being Spade, Garen who wields guns, a gun, being Diamond, Lango was Club, so he has a staff, and then Chalice because hearts, I guess a uh, bow, bow and arrow looked kind of like a heart. Well, also if you go by a tarot deck, the chalice was replaced by the heart. Yes, that, yeah, that, that is true. I think that was the meaning behind it. And this is one of the series that has a prime example of writer change done right. Because I, even though I love the first half of the show, when they changed writers, the show got even better in its second half. And they started introducing these new creatures that this company was creating called Artificial Undeads. Where they were undead, took the DNA of undeads and just made their own versions of them. Because with um, Langle, he actually started out more as a villain than a hero. And um, another really cool thing about... Technically, like, Ryuki had the most evil rise. Yes, but they, that was more of a Highlander motif. And they were, they were already bad people. Ryuki was a battle royale. This yes. was different. And also another thing about Blade is... All four of the riders get an upgrade form, but only Chalice and Blade have the true ultimate forms in this show, and there's a story reason for it, too. Well, no, Lego didn't get his upgrade form. He was these close. So, after Blade came out, 
the guy who was put, put in charge of Kamen Rider was like, you know, audiences are kind of um, bored of Kamen Rider at this point. Let's do something entirely new that's not a Kamen Rider series. They were going to do this first, this remake of an older toku sh uh, show about ninjas. Then they decided they were going to do a ninja yokai theme series. And it was going to be just a new, completely uh, new series. And then Takeda released a show called Ryukendo. And Toei said, well, this new show that has no ties to any other series really, might confuse audiences with our new show that will have no ties or anything. So let's stick with it being a Kamen Rider. So they ended up going with this show called Kamen Rider Hibiki, which may have also been based on a manga that Ishinomori was working on when he, was, when he passed away called Onigeki Hibiki. And it was about Onis who wield musical instruments to do away with the evil spirits of the world. Now, the first 29 episodes of this show are really amazing. The, it has this really interesting signature style to it, black screens of text. If you've ever watched Evangelion, it has similarities with the way it's done, that it's clearly had influences from aspects of that. Um, and the main character, Hibiki, he was an older character. The actor was 30 when they did this show, and apparently Japanese children found him hard to relate to. Me personally, I think he's the most relatable Kamen Rider because like me, he doesn't drive. In <laughs> fact, in one of the scenes here, him trying to drive a car is hilarious. It reminded me of teaching him. <laughs> and it was not like that. I just couldn't turn. <laughs> That's even worse. And then, so it's interesting to have, you have a Kamen Rider series, but the main rider doesn't know how to ride and he's drive it all at the beginning. And even in one of the scenes, he's, he's riding the bike with the secondary rider, and because he doesn't know how to stop the bike, he just jumps off the bike and lets it crash. And so he used drums for his style against the evil spirits. The other two riders you'll see, they, one of them who, is, who also is played by the guy who played Tuxedo Mask in the live action Sailor Moon series, he used horns, his name was Ibuki, and the other writer, Todoroki, uses a guitar. The villains are a mysterious lot that the way the show goes, because after episode 29, they brought in a new writer, new producer who completely overhauled the show to be more generic-like. And the villains plot never really went anywhere. And what's so bizarre is it had in no way take over the writing duties, which he... <laughs> He did Kiba and Agito, which awesome. and Pies. And the other aspects was, so when they're fighting, the writers fight these two male and female characters called Doji and Hime, and they're, they're humunculi and their voices are switched. So it's a man with the woman's voice and the woman with the man's voice. And they're very creepy, especially what you'll see the summer versions of them are very chatty where you're like, man, they're going to kill you even quicker than them. Because you could be just walking along, enjoying your life, and if suddenly the color filter changes around you, you're screwed. Because every time they would appear, a color filter would change, and their job was to feed a bigger monster that, the, that would attack called a Makama. And then in the second half, they kind of just went more of a generic route where everything become like, became like your standard Kamen Rider series. Hibiki stopped using his drums to use a sword and got a new upgrade form using that sword.
おいしそうじゃにおじいちゃんがおいしそうってことじゃあおいしそうなおじいちゃんにはうちの子のご飯になってもらいますよ After Kamen Rider Hibiki came the next installment, Kamen Rider Kabuto, which this one got out of hand with how many riders there were, but it was fine. Our main character kind of seemed to know he was invincible. He was always like, Grandma always used to tell me blah, blah, blah about how awesome I am. So now I'm a Kamen Rider because I'm awesome. That's you. Shut up. That, that's not totally completely true, but it's not totally untrue. And this one had an interesting motif because their base form, when they would transform, they'd have like an armored form that then they would use this thing called cast off mode that would give them a slimmer form that they would use to fight the villains with. And they could also slow down time, or as it's technically, they're not slowing down time, they're speeding up. So they're like the Flash with Kamen Rider. Now the villains are kind of like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. They, their motif was that they would be, because they were called worms. They were a duplicate person that would then transform into a monster, but their main goal was the first thing they would do when they took someone's identity, they would kill that person and then try to be undercover as that person until they needed to make their attack. Which was pretty frightening at times if you would just be walking along and, oh, hi, hi myself, wait, myself. Or, if you're an egotist, like, hey, what's up? I can finally have an intelligent conversation. Like me. I'm gonna press I'd play. be very scared if there was another version of him. Yes, <laughs> that's why we don't have children. Um. <laughs> Cast off. Cast off. Change the title. I could save time in a bottle. The first thing that I'd like to do. Save every day till eternity passes away. Talk over. I focused on it.
きのびたくなこうなったのは貴様らの企みか私に渡せお前の命は保証する So after Kabuto, they did new, their next series kind of went more of a sillier anime-esque route it's called Kamen Rider Deno. This one became such a huge hit for Toei that they pretty much copied the formula of this series for the next several entries. This one starts off with features one cat, one rider who has four different monsters that possess him, giving him four different rider forms. And typically, he can only transform into one form at a time, but thankfully, Toei had decided when they did their summer movie, they were gonna have all four at the same place at the same time, so it gives a great clip where you can see all four of his main forms in one without a lot of extraneous work. This one also had them dealing with, a lot of it was all based on fairy tales. And they were dealing with monsters that would try to grant the wish of the per that the person they desired. They would you would first see them as like a sandy reflection. The person would just be walking along, and all of a sudden, oh, there's sand everywhere. I hate sand. It's coarse. <laughs> and the monster would be like, yo, uh, yo, dog, uh, I'm gonna help you out. So what the uh, hell is that? I don't know. I, I was gonna say these things are made of sand sometimes, and it's like, wait. Can I just press play? Let me get to the rest of the story. Hot towels important. Yes. So Grandpa's gonna continue. I'm sorry. I'm All right, you young kids don't know how it is today. You and your downloading Common Rider with ease. Okay. The second airy rider. He, the actor who actually plays him was actually introduced in Hibiki as a possible Oni contest uh, person. And he pretty much plays the same character in this show that he did there. A complete unlikable douche. Everyone hated him so much in Hibiki that they started hating his character in Deno too. Yes. But yes. then he proved to be legitimately really awesome. <laughs> Actually, so honestly, nothing I, wrong with that. So I saw Hibiki year. I actually just saw Hibiki this yeah. year. So I love Deno, and I love all the writers in Deno. So I didn't know what he was talking about. Such an unlikable character, and yes, he is unlikable in Hibiki. But I'm like, he was so cool in Deno. I know. And then in Zio, they make the same. They make the joke. He's like, didn't I just see you? <laughs> <laughs> but Deno, went, Deno ended up becoming a huge hit that it's had spin-off movie after spin-off movie after spin-off movie. There are currently seven spin-off movies. But the actual actor who plays the writer very rarely appears in it, mainly because he's in another franchise now called Burnley Kenshin. He's so popular now. Yeah. Yes. Which is funny, considering it's also funny because the actor from the last series, Kabuto, also did his own live-action version of an anime character, that being Sebastian McAllis in the live-action Black Butler movie. Yep. Yep, in fact, the way tokusatsu in Japan is kind of like horror movies in America. An actor usually gets their start by appearing in a tokusatsu series. Yeah. Let's go with Denu. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
お前たち倒すけどいいよね答えは聞かないけど今日は全員まとめてクライマックスだぜあ、uh, <笑>
Additionally, the fan guyers they introduce towards the end of the show, they have, they're actually controlled by a group called the Checkmate Four, which are King, Queen, Rook, and Bishop. And you, the series shows us to various forms. So the 80s had their own versions of King and Queen, who, and who you'll see in here, which the King would also turn, have his own Kamen Rider form. The 80s version would be Dark Kiva. And then in the modern day version was... Saga. Saga, yes. My brain is expiring. <laughs> it's what you get for three hours of sleep. Yes. Quiet. Yeah. And then... Bishop and Rook were the same in both timelines. Am I allowed to press play? Yes. Yes, she. reviewed it back in October, it was hard to not play lots of Castlevania music, mostly because of copyright strikes. As a person who does a lot of sound only for fandoms for Kamen Rider stuff, every time it's Kiva, I always use Castlevania <laughs> music. And Kiva has my personal favorite opening theme of the entire Kamen Rider franchise. It is amazing. So after Kiva, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Kamen Rider's return, they apropos named the next series Kamen Rider Decade, which was to celebrate 10 years by having Decade have to gain the powers of all the previous riders from Kuga through Kiva to save the multiverse. That's always Decade's fault. Yes. yes. And even Zio has shown it's still Decade's fault. <laughs> it is a joke that will never be let down. Now, Decade went back to using a card motif, so he would use cards to use the rider abilities. He could also summon, uh, use, like, transformed the riders into weapons, which were like an ouch-inducing moment. He would even say, oh, this might be painful for a moment. No, that was Dien who says it might be painful. Yeah, he no. says it tickles. Well, well, yeah. Well, depending on your translation. It's True. And so this whole thing was meant to be a, just a celebration of that. And the hard part is when they travel to this multiverse of worlds, they decide to recast all the previous riders. For the most part, except for exception with Hibiki World. And Danos, to an extent. And then, technically Blade. Technically Blade. Oh. I don't you mean Black? Blade. Blade. Oh. Blade. Bla what? Well, uh, was pretty. Yeah, he does. Yes, he does later on. Yeah. 
Um, it's a weird one because of spoiler reasons. Decade's yes. A, a but then Decky decided, like, felt like they ran out of their plot in, like, episode 20. So then they started going back to the Showa world, and it turned out it was all a plot by Shocker. The villains from the original Kamen Rider show. So here are my last few clips of Decade, which I do not bother showing off the really horrible ultimate forms. Thank God. Oh, the yes. <laughs> which you could actually get all of the decade sounds for all of the other writers. It was so funny because I would drive them nuts playing Kiva and Ryuki. Now, the other thing about decade is none of the villains are actually his own villains, except for the guy in the trench coat and hat who we've never come to understand. Not even Zio explains him. All the all the villains in Decade were pretty much just based on all the previous Kamen Rider villains. We have the Grongi, the Lords, the Orphanox, the Mirror Monsters. Uh, one of the generals from X, uh, Apollo Geist, is one of the final yes. of the show. Shadow Moon was also there. Shadow Moon and then uh, General Shadow. Yeah, and let's... Well, here's a question for everyone. For um, how many people, for the few people who are here that um, didn't see Common Rider before, did you enjoy the panel and learn anything? Oh, yeah. And for anybody who's seen Common Rider with this kind of a nice, fun experience down memory lane, it's very hard to find Common Rider. It is! So see, that's why we host these panels, because then you can find the Common Rider fans. Now, with this panel, obviously it's phase one, so I'm sorry to say, but the rest of the Hasey era is in another panel. Oh, with right. that said, we have a question for to give away for Common Rider 01. Ooh. What is the question you want to Oh my god! I love how he puts the pressure on me. Okay. So he mentioned at the beginning of the panel um, about Ishinomori. What year did Kamen Rider first come out? I saw your hand go up first. It's 1973. Nope. Yes? 1968. Nope. 65? Nope. Okay. You guys are going too low. <laughs> all right. I feel like we're doing prices right, which is not a bad thing because I enjoy the show. Um, all right. Does anyone, uh, let's see. Sam? Thank you. So, the writer of Kiva, Fies, and uh, did the second half of Biki, and Hagito, he got his start with Toei 
way back in the day with a certain Super Sentai series. Does anybody know what the one that was? I don't know if anybody would know that. I do. Well, you don't count, Anthony. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> all right, you got the closest, honestly, at 1973, but it is 1971. So, rather than trying to think of another question, but I would still, um, what I would recommend doing is, if you haven't had an opportunity to um, watch Kamen Rider before, or want to find a way to watch it legally, definitely look at Toku Shoutsu. They actually are streaming right now on Twitch right now. They have um, Ryuki streaming right now on their Twitch channel. They also, another place you can go is Tubi. They have it as well. And then Shop Factory TV on their website. And then... And they, they are currently streaming the original series, all 98 episodes, Kuga, Ryuki, and Zero One. Now the cool thing about that Zero One Blu-ray set is it also includes the movie that comes after the series on it. Congratulations! Did everybody enjoy themselves? Does anyone have any common questions? Yes. Um, fun fact, the guy who played Deanne in Decade also played it like he was in love with Decade. Yes, he did. It was really fun, and then the guy who played Decade was like, please don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, the Blu-ray for the O's 10 year after film just came out in Japan today. So, And we do have business cards if you want the link to our channel and all the footage we're going to have for the weekend. Plus I review tons of Kamen Rider, Sentai, Garo, Metal Heroes, Ultraman. Isn't Hibiki your next review? Yes, Hibiki. Well, I'm working on Hibiki now and I'm watching Fives for review. Uh, I don't think you want to get to like actually. Well, thank you all for joining. I hope you had a good time.